Hey everybody, I am Catherine Barnes and I am here with my new fringe friend, Paco Earhart, who is coming at us from Orlando, where his show is at Orlando Fringe, and he's now bringing it to San Diego Fringe. And first of all, tell us the title of your show, because it's a great title. Well, <laughs> uh, well my, my, my show is called uh, Paco Earhart, Worst German Ever, because uh, that's where I'm from. And uh, I'm just not very good at being German. Uh, I'll say so, you're not. You relate to this interview. Come on, man. Uh, yeah, I was. I kind of slept in. <laughs> it's, it's been a bit rough here. Um, yeah, no, the, the weird thing is, like, the show I'm doing in Orlando is actually a different one. It's my oldest show called Five Step Guide to Being German. So I, I just want patrons pick for, for that show. So don't tell anybody, please. But I'm actually pretty shit at being German. Um, uh, but you know that what they say, like if you can't do it, teach it. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, boy, I, I know guess all about that's what that. I'm doing. <laughs> so you've got okay. So the show that you're doing in Orlando is the five step guide to being German, and then the show yeah. that you're doing in San Diego is the worst German ever. So like, tell us about the genesis of these shows, and do they relate to each other at all? Because they sound pretty contradictory. Uh, yeah, no, they don't you know, really. Um, I mean, the Five Step Guide to Being German was the sh first show I ever wrote that was initially for uh, Edinburgh Fringe in 2011, which you may know is the original fringe at an insanely big, like 5,000 different shows now, I think, that are each on around a month. So madness, uh, a lot of fun. But, but anyway, so I, I worked with um, British people uh, for a while I was like a nightlife entertainer for in Spain for very very uneducated and very anti-German British people uh so I had to hold my own in that like luckily you know I'm you know like some Germans do have a sense of humor and that served me well you know <laughs> I had to learn how to deal with you know rough people but but also I encountered just what they knew about actual Germany was so limited and so, uh, such stereotypes that, you know, I was just, you know, at some point, I mean, you, you get used to the banter and it's kind of fun. And at some point you go like, dude, what the, like really again, this, uh, you get to get tired of it. So I still remember saying to one of you know, them, like, dude, that's just not what we really like. And the guy said, oh, really? Well, well what do you Germans like then? And I said, eh. I don't know, like, it's like so hard to actually see yourself from the outside. What are we really like and why are we like that? So actually for years, I've been did actual research into, you know, how we grew to be the way you are. I mean, there's a reason Americans are so freedom loving, basically, and how that is your core value. Um, and it goes back to centuries. And you know, sometimes it doesn't make any sense anymore. Just like ours is keeping chaos at bay, which we had like for, for centuries. And so order and reliability and, you know, planning everything out, that's, that's kind of our thing. So I went into that, turned that into an Edinburgh show, and that's how I really got my, my uh, career got started back then. <coughs> but, um, you know, it's, it was a show that was about my nationality. And after, after that, I did that, did that show in Edinburgh, which went really, really well. The year later, nobody knew my name. Everybody knew, oh, you're the German. And I thought, like, yeah, that's all well and good, but I don't really want to be a German for a living. Uh, I'm a comedian, right? So, so I I actually made this way. Like, what I'm into, like, I love, like, you know, the stuff like the Daily Show and social commentary and talking about shit that matters in a way that is like, I like to be, I mean, not, not that I like to be offensive, but I like to think outside the box and sometimes do, like, mischievous. I think I like a bit of mischief. And sometimes I can rub some people wrong, but that's the kind I really enjoy. So I actually made a pr pretty drastic change in 2013. Uh, my show that was called, was called German, uh, German Unchained. I think it was the year that Django Unchained was out. And so there I did me, so Paco, like the why, you know, the way I am, the kind of stuff that make, that, that delights me. And um, so ever since I've been, you know, working on that more and more, and then Paco had worst German ever, I just, you know, I, like I said, I started in Edinburgh competing with like at the time, I think 3,500 shows. You have to be kind of good at marketing and worst German ever seemed to be, you know, quite the claim. <laughs> so, so I thought like, that's a good title. People are going to react to that surely. So, and I'm actually, yeah, I'm not very good. I'm not punctual. I'm not very organized. Uh, so yeah, it's like a title that works. So, okay. I have a question for you about, you know, what you were talking about with German identity. Um, 
So, and humor me on this, right? Cause you have to remember I'm American. So I was educated here and our education yeah. system, we learn American history for a really long time, which is <laughs> because it's one country and it's like 200, 300, maybe 400 years if we're being generous. Right. And yeah, then right. I had one year of European history, which is ridiculous. Right. Cause that's how many countries and how many yeah. you know, thousands of years. Some stuff happened. A few uh, things, right? One or two things, yeah. right? I remember the defenestration of Prague. I feel like that was the first thing we learned. Not bad. Uh, but anyways, this is what I wanted to ask you because when I think of Germany, like Germany is actually kind of a modern construction, right? Because yeah. there was Prussia and there was like Bavaria. And then I, I had a German, a, a teacher who was from Germany in high school. He had immigrated oh, right. here as, as, a, as a young boy. And so he didn't speak it or anything, anything, but he would tell us, you know, if the Bavarians had unified Germany, it would have been a very different country. But the Prussians oh, yeah. were the ones who unified Germany. So they're the ones who are like, mm, everything must be. Da, 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 da. So <laughs> are you like what kind of German, which part of Germany are you from? Now, firstly, I'm really impressed with the stuff, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, like, uh, uh, yeah, it would have been a different country. I think Bavaria was also relatively powerful but compared to Russia and no position to, uh, you know, unified uh, Germany at the time. Yeah, we've been a country since 1871. So, That's so less, time, less time than you have. Like, right. you know, it like says, you know, a century left, of course. And before that, we were up to 314 tiny independent countries. They were constantly at war with each other, constantly attacked, invaded, overrun from all sides. So... What you said, the def defenestration of Prague was the start of the Thirty Years' War, in which, which was basically all of Europe fighting mainly on what is now Germany soil, and like in some parts of Germany, half the population was killed. Mm. Uh, overall, I think it was a third of the population. It was like just imagine in you know if you had that now in America, and like 110 million Americans die in that. <laughs> you know that's uh, that's a lot. So that really influences, I think. Um, how you deal with, okay, we want safety, we want order, we never want crazy shit like that happening again. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you're right, there was actually, again, 1848, there was a um, attempt, there was a big revolution where, you know, uh, more just uh, citizens who were democratically minded wanted to unify, uh, you know, Germany as a republic with, you know, a ceremonial uh, king, um, but, you know, that didn't work out, so... So then we get unified by Prussia. Uh, and I think partly, I'm talking about this too much, oh God, we really go into really kind of some intellectual stuff here. But um, so uh, Prussia really you unified top down. Like they were really, okay, I'm, I'm saying this, and you know, I said this in my uh, five step guide to being in Germany for America. It's like, because we were so different, I think to this day, we just don't really know who we are because we're so different all over. And I think, Prussia, like, did it, said, now we're one now, we're strong Germany. Again, there's a lot of bullshit about, you know, this, you know, I would say, like, this, this overblown identity, this over, overly confident, you know, out of, out of time, like, a lack of confidence, really, over, overly confident identity, uh, you know, built on power abroad, you know, worshipping the military and thinking we're the greatest country in the world. And I always go, like, I don't know how to explain that to Americans. You wouldn't understand, you know, worshipping the military, thinking you're the greatest country in the world. There's no way you can understand that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, it would have been very different if uh, it had been somebody else. And, uh, and, yeah, now we're this, you know, now also, like, 2016, when you guys, you guys really changed us because, you know, when you, I mean, when I say you, I mean all Americans, elected Trump, we Germans, like, within one month went through an image change from probably Nazis to beacon of the free world. <laughs> that was quite, quite a change, you know. We're still not used to that. So uh, I think we're still kind of struggling a little bit. But we're not much more multicultural society now. So I think we're really kind of going in a good direction. They kind of like us. I don't want to live there anymore. I'm actually moving to America. I'm here on a three-year uh, artist visa, which is great. Uh, sl slightly dreading 2024, but we'll see. We'll we see. all are. We all are. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then I also feel as a German, I can tell you guys, look, you know, when we slipped into fascism, it wasn't, you know, obvious. We all thought like, oh, God, this is annoying. This is kind of bad. And, and we didn't notice until it was too late. So, 
maybe there's some historic lesson. <laughs> so. No, no, for real. And, and, you know, I think a lot about the fact that, you know, the reason that Germany slipped into fascism, I think was probably because of the Treaty of Versailles, right? Because they put all of Part, those yeah. like really intense economic restrictions on them. So the economy went to hell and that was where the fascism came in. And here it's that, you know, we've got this like Jeff Bezos and 1% type of dudes getting richer and richer and yeah. richer and everybody else is getting screwed. And that's why all this populism and fascism is taking hold, right? I, I, I agree. I think, you know, seeing that means I've, I've lived in many countries and I always thought like, it's amazing how in any country, the people most proud of that country are normally the kind of people that country has least reason to be proud of because it's you know it's, it's the people who are normally suffering from inequality the most but then it's, it's not only it's you know it's like 90 percent stupid people led by 10 percent evil people because you know if you're really struggling and things are getting worse and worse and you're kind of butthurt a little bit about that how he as a white man for example like you know you're not the be all and end all all the time and, you know, people all of a sudden consider other people's perspectives and you don't have a foot in the door just by being you. They, I think partly like for the you know, middle class that, that that loss of, you know, feeling they, they might slide into, you know, a much worse existence. I think that is uh, the, the fear of that loss can can lead to a kind of butthurtness that looks for you now, but we are the greatest. And, you know, they were just waiting for somebody to tell them that they're by nature better than everybody else. You know, that's the way where nationalism and chauvinism and all that can take hold. And in America, I do do think right now that, like, you know, the inequality you have is 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 really scary it's just too much i mean and it's just you know at some point if you just you know if you have sheep and you just shear them too close to the skin eventually they're going to turn on you and somehow that screw has been turned just too much probably since reagan i mean you'll know this better than me, than me, than me but and, and, and i hear that reagan really brought in you know this really pro-corporate and an environment that you know just really neglects actual people who need to live somehow but yeah then again yeah i love this kind of stuff i'll have to work my way into you know the, these topics and of course not on stage make them not quite so intellectual but kind of funny and accessible but i'm fascinated by these things and i think you know there's loads of americans fighting the good fight but of course it's not it's not that it's not that easy especially because i sometimes think like we liberals in the last like 10 years have not been great at marketing like you know the way i like you know like like we normally appeal to the rational mind and that's just parts of the population where it has a better idea to appeal to more emotional things like that well and i think you know i'm a teacher so i'm biased i think a lot of what's going on has to do with our crappy educational system i mean i i think if people are better educated they're better able to make the kinds of decisions that you're talking about to kind of look at things, Absolutely. See things more objectively. And we just, I mean, we don't value that here, bottom line. Right. So. Yeah, I feel like, oh God, that's such a big topic as well. <laughs> like, it is, I know. <laughs> and I'm trying to, I'm really trying to think my way into that as well, because I find that also, because I, I lived uh, actually, you know, I wasn't like, I was an exchange student in America when I was 17 for a year. Where? In North Carolina, loved it. Um, and it was like, I was in a very like liberal host family, which I only realized a couple of years ago because my host mom is just really lovely. She says, I realized in you know, 2014 or 16 when I visited, like she's, holy shit, I'm like 17. Like she works in like a charity for homeless black people and things, you know, you know black people think we want people don't give a diddy squat about them. And I want to change that. And it's just, you know, so beautifully aware and, <laughs> and, and sweet. And at the same time, this is the woman who was who lives now about uh, like a thousand feet from the farm she was the ones born on like she's rural as fuck but still has that mindset yeah that this awareness of you know we just need to make the, you know, the world a better place and you'll know, be good to other people and try and see other people's perspective and that's so i really enjoyed that uh, and so i have a real love for for america I really <laughs> i really do uh which is why i'm probably you know concerned and talk a little bit of shit about something going on but also yeah so the educational system yeah there i was there i would have normally been like in 11 like a junior but i went into senior year and it wasn't hard 
Um, so yeah, I don't know the ins and outs of the educational system, but it was a bit limited, like compared to to Europe. Oh yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, I want to say like because like Europeans said to say like, oh, Americans are stupid. They don't know anything, which is also, you also have the smartest people in the world when you look at your universities. Um, it's just like, you have like, like, I don't know, like only American is stupid with jazz hands. Um, <laughs> you know, our stupid people shut up because, and I think it's originally a, a classist thing, which is kind of not good. I think education is like a classist separate, like it is like, in, in Europe is much more about like status comes more from, I think, how much a person knows rather than how much a person owns. Mm. Um, so there is this, you know, this consensus of what, if, like of common knowledge, what a person should know, or if they jog, everybody's going like, whatever. And I think you don't have that, which is good because initially it comes from, you know, everybody's equal, but if everybody's equal and everybody's opinions are not suddenly equal, no, they fucking aren't. Like, you know, there is such a thing as simply just wrong, you know, fa things that are not facts and not every opinion deserves the same confidence because some are just fucking stupid. And, <laughs> and I think somehow the great, wonderful, you know, egalitarian, you know, principle initially of, uh, of America kind of backfires there, I think, you know, that lack of consensus, like, because if you know, I, I can have an opinion, doesn't matter, like, I can know these things, you can know those things, and I, so... I find it, you know, interesting. I will be, you know, not worried, but you know, I'll be interesting to uh, interested to see how that works on the stage for me. Because sometimes I do jokes that play or expect expect some knowledge play with the stuff that's in people's heads. And I think here, and I, like I said, I love Americans. There will be loads that do understand what I'm talking about. But if I if they don't, then that's on me. That's my fault, right? So I have to kind of put that in the setup more and explain. It, it, it'll be interesting to me to find out like what audiences are really like and what I can do to, you know, get the things across that I'd like to get across. And, and I know I kind of, I feel I'm sound kind of weird. Like I'm just kind of like this, you know, I'm like I have this Messiah car complex, but I, you know, I don't think I can save your country, but well, maybe, you know, an outside perspective sometimes can be inspiring. So we'll see. Oh, definitely. Well, and it sounds like audiences at Orlando Fringe have responded really well to you. Um, so it'll be yeah. interesting to see what the difference is at San Diego Fringe. Well, it is a different show. So um, because, you know, the Five Step Guide to Being German is also about a little bit about German history and German, also German stereotypes and what's behind them. And I intend to do that a bit less uh, in, you know, worst German ever. Of course, I think it's always good to have, you know, comparisons that I, you know, say, like, wh why I see your country a certain way and what we did, in the, like, like we said earlier, you know, like, when we slid into fascism, like, how that was. I think it's always good to have, you know, analogies and comparisons, so there will be that, but it will be less about, well, this is why we Germans are the way we are, because, you know, like, I don't know, like some people might be interested in that, but that's not this, sh this show here. So um, um, yeah, this, this here will be more about my, my travels and comparing cultures, which is kind of my thing. And, you know, just uh, some mischievous ob observations about, you know, what I see as, uh, so yeah, I, I wonder how, how that's gonna go down. Well, that sounds like stand-up comedy to me, uh, mischievous observations <laughs> about what you see. So how did you get started in stand-up? Um, well, I, I always wanted to be a writer, actually. I wanted to be, always wanted to be Jack Kerouac, um, you know, traveling the, like, you know, w without the misogyny that I now realize that I'm not in puberty anymore. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so I was like, I want to be a writer, really experience life to the fullest, see really weird things and travel and see weird countries and, and so on. And then, you know, like be inspired to write you know, great novels or whatever. And then it turned out that the life kind of worked. I hitchhiked out of Germany, like, and was, I also lived in Italy and Spain and, you know, and, and England and so on for a long time. And uh, so that was all kind of cool, but the writing was just really lonely and, <laughs> and very much, much less romantic than I had thought and way more work. <laughs> so, so that it worked so well. And then I, I worked as a hotel entertainer in like the cheapest all-inclusive hotel in like the worst, area where the like like the um most let's say uneducated 
classes of, of Britain uh, go on holiday and was, you know, confronted with that situation with pe- really lovely people, really nice people who just know very little and who are very rough sometimes in their communication, which I love because, you know, there was like this whole no holds bar, you know, you know, just very irreverent, you know, fuck it, we can say what we want, you know, it, says, it was beautiful. And so I really enjoyed like, it. Was, I mean, this was like more hosting game shows in hotels and he was like best couple, you know, couples competition and whatever. And, um, but I realized I really enjoyed being on stage and I, I remembered then how much I'd love watching stand up in North Carolina when I was 17, because that was totally new to me. That didn't exist in Germany at the time. So I thought like, maybe if I come, can combine the writing and this stage thing, then maybe I could do that. And uh, so I did a couple of years in Spain, which was, yeah, eventually I said, like, okay, I want to do this for real now. And I moved to London, which like in Europe is like the capital of stand-up. I mean, you guys know how many good things that uh, the Brits produce. And so that's where I got started. And, you know, at that point, I'd just written like material for seven years I could never use. It was like, yeah, kind of like went over most people's heads. It was just, well, but I felt like, oh, but I'm really interested in that. I think there could be funny stuff in here. So, so I'm like, all right, I'm moving to London. And so I hit the ground running kind of with lots of material and the experience and hand- handling slightly rough people. And uh, yeah, and then I took it from there. Then I wrote this show, you know, Five Step Guide to Being German, which was hugely su- successful. And that led me to tour the world for years, like Australia and Britain and you know, Malaysia and Canada and New Zealand and, you know, uh, and yeah, and then I made the switch eventually to the comedy that's really me and close to my heart. Uh, and that's where I am. And now I'm finally coming to America. <laughs> it took me a awesome. while. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of started here. That's what I think was really interesting, that, that this was yeah. the place that got you interested in stand up. And now you've gone over the world and now you're coming back to do it again. That's really cool. Yeah, about 30 years later, like I, I realized, you know, the other like, you know, thing about a week ago when they asked me, have you been in Orlando before? And I, and I realized. Yeah, I think it's 30 years ago, I had my very first kiss here. <laughs> Bit of a late bloomer. So that was when I was, I was you know, 16 still at that time. I was in uh, in Disney World <laughs> when we like on this wow. exchange student uh, tour of, uh, of Disney World. <laughs> you know how uh, I have an experience, my friend. <laughs> yeah, in Disney World. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it feels kind of like uh, coming full circle in a way, because at the time, like America to me is, has a couple of things that Germany doesn't have, or is like the opposite of very different from Germany in a way that to me, to my heart and soul was like water in the desert. To me, it's like, oh my God, this is the country I should have been born in. America is amazing. This can-do attitude and optimism. Germans, you know, go and think, oh, well, let's plan everything out. Let's be really careful. And, oh, no, this is new, so it's probably dangerous. And here it's like, yeah, let's make it happen. Let's, let's see how, how we make it work. And that to me is that finally, so because that's my personality. So finally, people who want to make things work instead of doubting things all the time. And... Uh, and uh, and yeah, my you know I think my mom always because I hated losing, so mom always tried to teach me how to be a good loser. Like when I lost, because I, I get to like playing tennis, I smashed my rackets all the time. <laughs> and he and, and then came to America and then like oh fuck losing, don't even think about that. Now you want to win. I was like yeah, exactly. Thank you. Finally, <laughs> I don't know. So with various things that to me were just you know beautiful and. Uh, and now I also see the good things we have in Germany that maybe American men can learn something from. I genuinely believe around the world we can really learn from each other. And I think that's a really good thing to be inspired by each other. Because if I go like some things are better in Europe or in Germany, I definitely there's some things better in America as well. And so that's kind of what, what I'm about. I love different cultures and mindsets and then trying to build bridges and, you know, make make. Because that's that's what my experience is. Some some like experiences elsewhere. I was called like you know it's like getting question asked questions answered that you never had. Like you get the answers like oh shit that could be oh my god this is you know complete mind shift by seeing something elsewhere that is so different from anything your own country does and thinks about. And I think that is hugely inspiring. And so, like, I've had that in my life, like, whenever, wherever I travel. So I hope I can do that, bring that to a certain degree um, via, via stand-up. So, yeah, that's 
that's I love. I love it. Stand up with a mission. And you know, as you were talking, I guess I was thinking about the fact that there are a lot of people in the US who have German ancestry, you know, including myself. So I guess what I oh. wonder is like, is there any piece of German culture that like you see reflected in American culture that maybe was was brought or did, does it just seem completely different to you at this point? That's a that's a good question. And I'm I'm not entirely sure. I would have to think about that. I do know that German is is actually the biggest ethnic, the biggest ethnicity in uh, in America. Like I don't know if now Lat I mean Latino is also a different country, so I don't know if it counts as one, but it is actually still like the biggest. Um, of course, you know, America speaks English, so you know don't see that so much. I think like one thing I I, I think uh, is very American or really influenced America in, in both a good and a bad way. I, um, and I mean, la la largely good, you know, your like freedom loving, like, because back then, this, you still hear like, they're just generous of our freedom. They just hate our freedom. At least we're a free country. Dude, you know, we're all democracies now. Like, like it's time has moved on. Like at the time, 1776, you guys were the only actually free country where everybody could be themselves. There was no, no, no king or no evil authorities that uh, like limited what you did. And so um, I think that's why, you know, those core values we have, like in America, like the allergy against anything that limits, limits your freedom. That is what makes you, well, us, allergy against chaos. Oh shit, like, no, we, no, 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 we can't let that happen. Like just every, control everything. And, and I think for you guys is like, is this like individual freedom? Because that was like, was people running away from oppression, like actual oppression, not a president trying to introduce healthcare. Sake. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, I feel oppression and so um, people came here also like this feeling of leaving the past behind the old country is behind you this is the new thing you start Americans very much are future facing whereas we are a bit about like you know you know backwards failure looking at the past a lot more all, all the things I've done gone wrong in the past and you guys were like oh the future is a good thing for us on oh, the future bad things are always kind of the future so, so yeah, you guys go like anything is possible. We go yeah, especially the bad things. Uh, so, so it's so I think that kind of influences your your mindset. Uh, this and you know, also now Americans sometimes it's like amazing how I make jokes about stuff that happened four years ago and people were were talking about it. It was like all again like, the the Volkswagen emission scandal like a couple of years ago. Like I had a joke on that in my show. That's kind of out now because people well, we don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's three fucking years ago. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> so sometimes I feel like you know everything is so it's very fast paced here, and then looking backwards, it's just not something that Americans, on average, I mean, very I'm usually generalizing, of course, but um, tend ten, ten to do. Uh, so I think so. It's more than you know, I think those general things that influence the mindset here. I would have to think to what degree um, German thinking and culture actually influenced America. And, and it's also interesting. I don't know, there was a book like The Nations of America. I haven't read it, I just know about it. And it says like how America is kind of made up of seven little countries because like there's seven zones that were like, like populated or you know that had immigration largely from say Protestant Germans here or um, I don't know, some certain other religion, English people there in, the, you know, in Sweden. I, guess, I, don't, I haven't read it, like I said, uh, yeah, I really want to. Uh, but so they say there are actually vastly different mindsets, like well, the West Coast, or then you have, you know, someone say North Carolina, like they're probably just the mindsets. It's like, like it's two different countries. So I don't even know, like I'm, I'm sure there's probably a region where people are more German, but um, as of yet, I'm... God, I talk so much. That little question you ask, and basically my answer is, I don't know. I just said it in five minutes with lots of other shit. Sorry, <laughs> must be ADHD or something. That's okay. We do <clears throat> we do a lot of ADHD here, but you know, I I think it would probably probably within different areas. There's like pockets, you know, like I know there's like certain areas like. The Pennsylvania Dutch, who were actually mm. German, right? Or um, I, I would suspect that, like in the Midwest, there's probably a lot of German immigrants in different areas, and so it probably just requires further research, which is essentially what you said. So <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, 
Yeah, well, you really get like, you know, I'm going to like after this interview, I'm, I'm going to think about that because that's actually an, an interesting question. <laughs> well, if a joke happens in your show about it, you have to be like, copyright, Catherine Bars. No, I'm just kidding. That's very American <laughs> of me. I'm trying to pr protect my intellectual property over here. And I'm going to threaten oh my you God. because I'm so American. No, I'm just kidding. No. Have you called me lawyers already? <laughs> oh, my parents are lawyers. I'm all set. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I hate lawyers. Check out, have you seen Don't Be a Lawyer, the song from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? No. Should be required uh, viewing in American schools. Anyways. Oh, wow, anyways. okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you, but. <laughs> awesome. Anyways, so, okay, my last question is. My question is, are we gonna are we gonna do comedy in Spanish together? Oh, that's right. Yes, you know, I I don't know. Um, so for for my viewers who don't know what he's referring to, um, we were talking in the San Diego Fringe Facebook group about going to Tijuana to do stand up comedy in Spanish, and I guess that's something that you know how to do. And by the way, your name's Paco, which is not very German. How did that happen? Um, yeah, that happened. I lived in Spain for eight years. Ah. And in Spain, like Spanish people and the letter H are not friends. And my real German name is Erhard. Like what I use as my last name is Erhard. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, whenever I introduce myself to resuscitate people. Um, now it's like, I'm going to tell you that I actually did tell the story on, on stage. I'm going to tell you the slightly longer version because I found it endearing how like my neighbor Amparo in Valencia, where I live, like it was very Spanish. Like it was, I lived in the old town in this, this like, as the, you know, Jack Kerrick, I wanted to be in this really decrepit little apartment that I think the bathroom floor collapsed two months after I left, uh, I, I heard, but so uh, Amparo lived on the fourth floor and you know, like, like behind the house, like in the little courtyard, like the wind, like I was on the uh, first. So she had this little basket on a string that she would let down to give me an onion or borrow a lemon or something. It was really sweet. And then she always called me from a window, you know, Aleman, Aleman, Aleman. <laughs> so, so yeah, German, German, I've forgotten your name again. And so, yeah, you know, I still remember, like, like I said, like, this is like almost material now, and I'm sorry about that, but it's just like really how it happens. I remember just leaning out the window, looking up and saying, you know, um, you know look, you can't just call me German all the time. I said, look, my middle name, middle name is Frank. Why don't you just call me Franco? And she nearly fell out the window. Franco! Because that was no. dictator. It was a no. dictator in Spain <laughs> till 1975. And um, and yeah, so weirdly, as you will know, um, so my middle name is Frank and Paco is short for Francisco for some reason nobody understands. And so she, she said Paco. And I felt that, like, yeah, I just hitchhiked out of my country. New life, new name. I'll have it. Thank you. And uh, and weirdly, all my friends at the time, you know, I thought I thought they'd say like, dude, no, you're stuck with Earhart, screw you. Uh, but no, they said like, yeah, Paco suits you. Yeah, you're, you're Paco from now on. Like, okay, uh, cool. And that was about 20 years ago, and uh, here we are. <laughs> so you're Paco. I love it. So so Paco and I were discussing going to Tijuana to do some stand up in Spanish, and uh, I, if that happens, that San Diego Fringe Festival is usually. Um, international. So they usually do some shows in Tijuana as well. Um, I did that the first year that I did it and it was really fun. But this year, you know, with all the COVID stuff, I guess that they haven't been able to make that happen. So if you and I are actually able to go to TJ and do stand up, we will make San Diego Fringe International this year. That would be amazing. Let's let's be ambassadors. <laughs> We're on it. Okay, awesome. I got to brush up on my stand up comedy and my Spanish. <laughs> well, yeah, I gotta, I gotta tell. Like, I, I've done, uh, done it before in Argentina and and in Berlin, and every time doing stand up in Spanish to me is like doing comedy for the first time again. I'm so nervous, so excited. It's like, how the hell am I gonna do this exactly? <laughs> and uh, and if it goes well, and like both times it went well, I am so elated. I can't sleep till four in the morning. <laughs> it's really, yeah, just, you know, being being all young and fresh again. So we'll yeah. see how it goes. I know that feeling and I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it was like in, in Argentina or for the Spanish speaking audiences in Berlin, but I find that Mexican audiences tend to be pretty, like, pretty friendly, you know, pretty good crowds. So, so did you say me Mexican audiences or American yeah. audiences? Uh, Mexican, Tijuana. Well, oh, I right. mean, you know, yeah. Right. So. Anyway, we will we will figure that out. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, where Where can people see your show? Where can people find you online? uh online yeah i have to get better at social media but i am there 
So uh, I am Paco Earhart, so that's P-A-C-O-E-R-H-A-R-D um, on pretty much everything. So on, on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter, I think on YouTube, it's Paco Earhart uh, dash TV. Uh, and uh, and it's also pacoerhard.com. There's some some clips there as well. And uh, and yeah, and I'll, I'll be on at the Mary Hitchcock Puppet Theater. Uh, and first show is on the second, so next Thursday at 4 p.m. I think. Hope someone comes to that. And uh, yeah, and there's like five five shows in total. Just gonna go to the you know, to the uh, fringe uh, website, and that's where I am. And maybe and then maybe I'll link to the link. That would be. I will absolutely. Okay. I'll make sure people have links to tickets, links to your socials, all that great stuff. And wonderful. I, I want to be there for your first show. I don't know if I can because it typically <laughs> happens like right after I'm done teaching. I wish I could bring all my students. Come to the second house. show. The second <laughs> show. Oh yeah, that would be wonderful. It's fine. Don't 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 go out of your way. If you come to the second show, it'll make me happy. That works. I'll okay, outstanding. Yeah, well, hey, sure. thanks. Thanks so much for talking to me today. I'm sure lots of American people will have learned lots of things just from listening to this interview. <laughs> well, well, let, let's hope so. Let's hope it wasn't boring to, for two people because I, I, I find these things fascinating. But same here, same here. So um, I will, I will see you at French. See you at French. Thanks a lot. Bye. Have a good day.